I'm your Ellen in charge today. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, my name is S. June Kennedy. Now, who can believe this report? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us again. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, my name is S. June Kennedy. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Roger's peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of the Lord. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And I want to say welcome everyone into the presence of the one who gave himself to ransom us from sin. Welcome to the sorrows associated with the one who died for us. Welcome to the manifold blessings awaiting those who are faithful. Welcome to the one who is alive. Yes, the one who is alive and says, come unto me, all you who are weary, all you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a day of rest and gladness, a day of peace and joy. This morning, our opening song is going to be done by Darren Davis, but I want you to know it's entitled The Sacrifice. But I want you to know that this was written by our own elder K. Anthony Fowler, words and music. And sometimes during the week, you will hear him perform it himself. But today, you are going to hear from Darren Davis. He walked this lonely road for me He walked this lonely road for you He bore your cross He bore your shame He bore your sin said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said, Woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. He said, My At this time, we will invoke the presence of God in our midst as we come together today to worship him and him only. I'll brief briefly from our hymnal, H, number 833, says, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full with his glory. Hosanna 
Blessed is he who comes in name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. Let us bow our head. Our oh, Father and our God, as we come to you this morning to give you worship and praise, dear Lord. We invoke your presence in our midst. We know you're ever present with us, Lord. But the need for us to stop and recognize the fact that you are the reason for this moment. We thank you for bringing your people together, dear Lord, to praise your name. And whatever is done today, whatever is transpired in music, in song, in words, in meditation and prayer, may you be the focal point of everything, dear Lord. We thank you. We bless your name in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This morning, it has been laid in my heart. I had a very good conversation with a young lady that is asking me to do a stewardship weekend with her church. And she came up with the topic of prosperity. And I asked her the question, uh, do you know what the word prosperity actually means? And of course, she began to talk about the need of what the worldview, which is not necessarily wrong because many of us, we look at the prosperity to have a lot of things and doing well and doing good. And so I phrased the question, was Joseph prospering in the house of Potiphar? Now, through the eyes of the average person, including myself, I would say no. How can you be prospering when you're enslaved to a master? But I want to take a few minutes this morning to say to us, Joseph was prospering. Yes, he may have lost his freedom that he had with his father, that young man that had everything in life that he thought, but God saw the need to work with him. And so God saw the need to put him in a situation that he would grow him up very quickly. And so in the house of Potiphar, Joseph quickly ascended from the rank of servant to the rank of steward. And so I went ahead to explain what the word being a steward in someone's house. Briefly, when you're a steward, you pretty much take the place of the master. You are now in charge of the other servants. You are now, your words are bounded. It binds things as if the master is there. And you are pretty much having you, you wear different clothing, you have a lot of freedom. The only person that is higher than you in the house is the master. And so Joseph could have done anything he wanted to within reason with the master. But Joseph remembered one significant thing. When we're bound to our master, a steward, we must act and behave in a way that the master expects us to act and behave. And through our action and our behavior, we reap the prosperity that the master gives us. Amen? So when we are in the master's stead, when we're doing the work for the master, and our master is Jesus Christ, Paul said, I better be enslaved with the word of God than anything else. And so therefore this morning, being a steward of God is one of the greatest position we could ever be in. Because when we're God's steward, we're prospering. I remember a young man said to me, pastor, so what you mean is that if I don't have, if I think I don't have anything in the world here, I just need to ask my daddy, which is God and he'll provide it for me. I said, yes. God provides for each and every one of us as we look around this morning, the very fact that we're here this morning, we're prospering. And I want to say hallelujah to that. God provides our health. Yes, he provides our wealth. He provides our state of mind. He wakes us up each morning with a conscious mind to worship him. And so brothers and sisters, as long as we are in God's home, we're in God's stead, we're prospering. So every Christian that believe and serve the Lord prospers. Amen? That is the true meaning of prosperity in the eyes of God. Amen. And this time, we're asked to come and bring a gift to the Lord. And I like to say that it's unfortunate that pagans, when they come to their gods, they have a gift to bring. Christians, you know, you might, you might say we don't have the funds to bring, but we have our worship to bring. We have our time to bring. 
And we have very different things that we can bring to God. Don't let the pagans outdo us when they come to their God to worship. Amen. So this morning in stewardship, we will come to God. Yes, some of us had the opportunity to earn a living, to return a faithful tithes and offering. But there are some of us that did not have that opportunity, but we had the opportunity of time. And we can give that time to God this morning. We have the opportunity of worship. Each and every one of us can give a worship to God this morning. And so as I'm asking, before we pray, we have the link out there that we can return our tithes and offering. We also have, we can drop it by the church. And what I usually do is go online. You can actually go online. There's a donation um, button. You link into that and you can connect it. And you, we are asking you this morning, this is the time where we come to God in worship, returning our tithes and our offering in thanksgiving for what he has done for us. So let us pray as we give thanks for the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, this is a time where in our worship that each and every one of us can do something for the worship of you. You have blessed us all week, dear Lord, and um, some of us had the opportunity to, to earn a living. And you ask us to return a faithful tithes, 10% of what we have earned, and give an offering. And we thank you for us, those individuals, dear Lord. There's some of us that may not have been able to work, but we have other things to bring. We don't only look for funds, Father. We we'll look for time. So this morning, we thank you for those that can contribute their time to your work. We also thank you for those who can contribute their worship in praise and honor and glory to your name. And Father, as I stand here this morning, I can just imagine the glorious moment when we all shall meet in that sea of glass and reminisce about the time that we participated in the work of this great salvation that's carried on and that we played a part for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your servants, your stewards, your faithful and trustworthy stewards this morning. Bless this church, Father. We are moving along in a very great and positive way because of your hand. And whatever is done this morning, Father, whatever is returned to you, may you multiply 10 times 10 that we can see the glory of your beautiful, beautiful, bountifully stewardship in us, Father. These things we ask in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Amen. Hallelujah. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure save from wrath and make me pure not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands could my zeal no rest by no could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath. When my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Amen. Amen. The word of the day is... Hi guys, do you know what time it is? It's children's story time! Have a great day! <laughs> Good morning, happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Is everyone doing okay? Yes. yes. Are yes, you okay? Good. The story this morning is about a little boy. His name is Sam. Okay? Sam was from a different country. And one day he realized that he was a different color from all his friends. But even though he was different, a different color, he knew that Jesus loved him. 
So, because, and why does he know that Jesus loves him? Because he would go to church every weekend with his parents. And you know, Jesus loves us and he loves everyone. So one day, Sam was walking. And while Sam, when Sam was walking, he looked up in the sky. He looked up in the sky and what did he saw? He saw some balloons. He saw a blue balloon. He saw a white balloon. He saw a red. He saw a green balloon. What else we have? He saw a white balloon. And he realized, guess what he realized? He realized that Jesus made all the colors to fly despite of he being black. So one day he said, well, God made all the colors. God made me. And I see the balloons can fly. I can grow up to be somebody no matter my color. So guess what? Sam grew up to be a pastor. Not only a pastor, but a pastor of a big church. God don't see colors. He created us all different. No matter our color, Jesus loves us, and we can become anything that we want in this world, no matter what, the color of your skin. And as the sign says, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. So who got to pray for us this morning? Can I ask Nyla to pray for me this morning? Nyla, are you on? Amen. 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 Thank you, Nyla. And continue to have a wonderful summer, boys and girls. Jesus loves the little children, no matter what color you are, no matter where you're from. Now, it is the blessed or prayer when we take time to tell everything to God. Whatever has been on your heart for the week, please. Go to the chat and place your concerns there. And we'll have two individuals, Sister Diane and Pastor Kennedy, who will present your cases before God. Now we'll have more prayer meditation and while that is well, please go to the chat. Thank you. 
Shall we pray? We love thy Sabbath, Lord, and worship at thy will. Oh, may these hours sweet peace afford and deepen faith instill. Lord God, your love has called us here, as we by love for love were made. Your living likeness still we bear, though mad, dishonored, disobeyed. We come with all our hearts and mind to call your name, your love to find. Sovereign Lord, we come to you this Sabbath day through your son, Jesus, to give you praise and to thankfully worship you on your holy day. May the Holy Spirit tabernacle with us. May your peace rest on us, I pray. Cleanse and forgive me as I pray on behalf of this waiting congregation. I pray that this church and its members will have a deep burden for evangelism as you request of us. As we enter this special week, may you cleanse us as we enter into this week of spiritual reflection on the sacrifice of your dear son, Jesus Christ. His several last words, as he took all the sins of mankind upon himself. Great physician, I pray for the sick and shut in in our congregation, those who ask for special prayers or visitors, friends and relatives. Bring healing and comfort according to your will. Give them an insight into your love, mercy and forgiveness. Help that they will turn to you and be closer drawn even in this time of affliction. Hear and answer my prayer, O Lord, in the name of your precious Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So Lord, we answer this prayer right now by presenting to you the prayer partners, individuals for whom we have been praying week after week, presenting their names before your face. While we may not call their names individually this morning, we want to ask you that you attend to each one's need. Create an urgency in their hearts so that they can realize that somebody's praying for them and somebody is seeking to give them an invitation to know Jesus more intimately. So I pause at this time that each of us will put our hearts and our minds and our spirits on somebody that we want to see be saved in your kingdom. I'm putting my mind on a few at this moment. Yes. Yes, dear God. We present these before your face and others. And we present the sick of our congregation before your face. Mighty struggle is going on as we read in the Sabbath school lesson this morning. Our bodies. As we read in our Ministry of Health and Healing in the early mornings. We also recognize that sometimes we are at fault for what happens to us, but what a God, a forgiving Savior, a great creator, a redeemer, who loves us and takes care. Finally, today we present before your face the one who you have called to break the word of life to us, Dr. Gene Donaldson. God, we know that though he has preached multiple sermons, each occasion is different. The ministry is different. The call is different. The listeners are different. In his case, 
But somebody is waiting for a special moment to hear the word of life. So today I ask for a special anointing upon him. Anoint him again and help that his voice of proclamation will touch a heart. Especially as he opens for us a meditation on this season. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm taking time right after the prayer to introduce to you Dr. Gene Donaldson. When we introduce him in other contexts, it is notable that it is said about him, he is a minister with many years of experience in ministry. Across Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, other places, and all of the places that he supervises pastors. When we have a complaint, he has a broad shoulder, mm -hmm. and so he can take our complaint. When we have questions about resources, or he finds resources, what he does. He's also in actual responsibility for the elders of our churches in terms of providing elders education and their relationship to pastors. So he will tell you at a point that there is going to be an elders training in the month of June, and therefore you will see him. So I want to welcome him to our congregation today. He's learning about our congregation and what it looks like and our effort to try to integrate ministry both in our little church house and also on the platform. So Dr. Donaldson, at the end of this session, please write me a note. Let me know what are the things we can do to enhance our worship, but at the same time to reach a public that God wants us to reach. I want to welcome you to our congregation today as you bring to us the blessings from God and from across this great conference, Allegheny East Conference. God bless you. After the meditation, then we will hear your voice. Amen. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Give us this day our daily bread. To Dr. Robert Kennedy, the resident angel of Emmanuel Worship Center. To Dr. S. June Kennedy, first lady of Emmanuel Worship Center. To all of the ministry leaders, to all of the disciples, members, visitors, and guests, it is indeed a august privilege for me to be worshiping with you on this wonderful Sabbath and this wonderful experience that you are about to enter in. And I certainly want to thank Dr. Kennedy for the very gracious invitation to participate in this wonderful week of spiritual emphasis. Amen. Where you are examining the seven last words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. I want to just say a word of thanksgiving to your pastor, to the First Lady, to let you to know that uh, Dr. Kennedy and Dr. June Kennedy are highly esteemed in the Allegheny East Conference. And I am privileged uh, to know them both as friends and colleagues. Uh, your pastor brings a breath and wide berth of knowledge, both 
to pastoral ministry and to the academic arena. God has richly endowed him with special gifts for the body of Christ, which he and Dr. June have poured out on behalf of our church for many, many years. And I just wanted to uh, take a minute to uh, certainly thank both of them for uh, the benefit they have been both to me personally and to the Allegheny East Conference. And we are grateful today, and I'm sure your congregation uh, senses and benefits from all that uh, Dr. Kennedy brings to the table. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Kennedy and Dr. June Kennedy for your sterling example and blessing to us all. Well, brothers and sisters, friends and guests, uh, I have been asked uh, to talk with you about uh, the first words uttered by Christ yes, sir. as he was on the cross. And I have entitled my remarks, The Phantom of Forgiveness. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads at this time as we ask God's permission. Father, we pause just for a moment to breathe in your atmosphere. Mm. What a wonderful opportunity is being taken advantage of by this congregation to once again, as we enter into the world calls the Easter season, yes, sir. to turn our minds and eyes upon the most critical transformative historical event that has ever occurred. That is when you went to Calvary's cross, and died for our sin. Now, Father, we pause as we start our journey today to ask your manifold blessings and presence. Mm -hmm. Hide your servant in such a way that your people might capture the splendor of him who really matters. For I have sense enough to know that they are on this virtual airspace worshiping in person to hear a word from you. So hide your servant behind the shadows of the cross. Your splendor might be seen. This is our prayer in the loving and precious and holy and righteous name of Jesus Christ, who died on a cold, cruel cross, rose again on the third day, now lives to intercede, and soon and very soon, will come back again. The Phantom of Forgiveness. I'd like to read again our launching text for this message. It's found in the book of Luke, the 23rd chapter. And I'd like to read in your hearing verse 33 and 34. I'm reading from the New English translation, but I trust whatever translation you have will carry its import. Notice what the word says. So when they came to the place that is called the skull or Calvary, they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right and one on his left. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. 
I want to suggest to you today, my brothers and sisters and friends and guests, that the final words uttered by a person before their death are often of great importance. And the final words of Jesus prior to his excruciating death on Calvary's cross are no exception. Christ uttered seven statements of importance and significance. The first of which is our text of consideration found as I read earlier in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Man had done his worst to the best that God offered. The one who had made the world came into the world and the world knew him not. Eyes which he created saw no longer any beauty in him. The God man dwelt among us and all we could really tolerate was 33 and a half years of perfect sinless living. When he was born, there was no room for him in the end. And now, now, now as he approaches death, there is no room for him in our hearts except on a cross. A mock trial was conducted A cross was secured and nails were piercing his flesh. And there he hung in silence until his lips are seen moving. Does he cry out for relief? Does he shout for support? Does he rail curses at his crucifiers? Does he plead his innocence? Does he bemoan and complain like the other two criminals, one on the right and one on the left? No, the record says that when his lips begin to move, he prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. In other words, I am no longer able to use my hands to bless, for you have nailed them to a tree. I no longer can use my feet to carry me on missions of mercy, for you have nailed them to this cross. I can no longer get my disciples to do my work in my stead, for they have all forsaken me and fled. The only option that will allow me to still be a blessing to you is to extend grace to you by prayer. He no longer can minister to us, so now he ministers for us. His only care is still for those whom he came to seek. One thing and one thing, even in the midst of his excruciating pain and his circumstances, which were daunting, the only thing occupying him and his mindset was you and me. Like a bullet shot from a gun that speeds toward a singular target, all of his strength and soul speeds onward to one singular target, the salvation of us all. His persevering love 
cannot be deterred even by facing raw evil at its best. They spit on him, they scourged him, they beat him, and then they crucified him. And the only response that he provides is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Notice the components of his prayer. He does not address it to the crowd. He does not address it to his crucifier. He does not single out the priest. No, he addresses it to the source, to the father. And his request is a simple one. Up to now, Christ has never asked the father to forgive. This is the first time. For Christ, when he uttered this statement, no longer represented God to man, but he now represented man to God. That mysterious exchange was taking place where Christ was becoming sin for us, the one who knew no sin. And as such, now he prays. As a representative of man to God. Christ could forgive while on earth. But while on the cross, he was lifted up, lifted up. So he could do is all he could do was draw all men unto him. Look at the object of his prayer. It's others. He does not pray for himself. He prays for others. Father, forgive them. 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 Not just the Roman soldiers that nailed his precious hands to the wood. But them, meaning the collectiveness of humanity, even you and I who were not yet born are included in that them. For the them is in the present tense, meaning whoever is a part of the human family that falls so short of what God expects. Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. And he gives the reason why. For they know not what they are doing. In other words, Father, they don't know what it is that they are missing when they don't have a relationship with us. Father, I plead, hold back until the Spirit can have an opportunity to woo their hearts so that they can know what they are missing. Yes. yes, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. They are like little children that must be guided. They don't know the implications of their sins. They don't know the rupturing of the relationship. They don't understand the deviousness of the evil one. They don't know. So Father, forgive them until my love can overshadow them until what I do at this event called Calvary can so be broadcast that they have an opportunity to have their hearts 
convince. There are a couple of lessons here from this first statement that start us on the journey, and it is why it is the first statement of the seven things that Christ uttered. First, I want you to see that because Christ uttered this statement, it places a significant responsibility on each of us to forgive. In the little book, Colossians chapter three, verse 12 and 13, Paul makes this interesting statement. He says, because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, as Christians, we are to put therefore kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearance, there it is, forbearance for one another. For if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave us. And his emphasis is on this verse. The idea that in the midst of Christ's ordeal that he could declare Forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Paul says it is now incumbent upon us who bear the name Christian to approach others in kindness, humbleness, long suffering, meekness, and forbearance because just as Christ forgave, so also are we to do it. Amen. Forbearance and forgiveness are not the exception for Christians, but they are the rule. No, we don't get to act in our own selves. And then occasionally, as we decide, we will forgive. No, Paul says, because Christ made this statement, we are now obligated to act in the same manner that he did, which means that we are placed in the position where forgiveness and forbearance are the rule. They are the standard by which we conduct ourselves. The code of the kingdom is not do it to others before they do it to you. No, it is not go ahead and make my day. No, it is to forgive others as Christ forgave us. It is tantamount to the statement when Jesus says, love others. If he had just left it there, we could have interpreted it. it. We could have defined what love was. We could make it up on our own. We could use it when we want it and didn't do it when we did not want to. But he doesn't say that. He says, love others as I have loved you. And now when you look at how he loves us, we can't escape. And Christ, Paul is saying the same thing in Colossians. Because Christ made the statement in the midst of his ordeal, when common sense, when humanity, when a sense of justice would have been Lord, deal with them for dealing with me like this when I am innocent. When I have not committed any sins. When I have done nothing but spread love to other people. And yet, the Bible says, Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And now you and I are thrust as Christians into the forgiveness arena where we cannot escape. If Christ could say, Father, forgive, 
even when spikes were driven into his flesh by the sheer delight of the captors, sons and daughters of Abraham spit on the living God. And they provided the lowest insult that a crowd could ever do. They talked about his mother and urinated on the son of God. Then it says to me that as long as there is breath, there is hope for the most difficult situations that I may encounter and for those who would be classified as the chief of sinners. Thank you, Jesus. Now, some of us need to know that because we have loved ones who refuse to heed the warning of the impending doom. Some of us need to know that and hear that because we know sons and daughters in our family that the more we tell them about Jesus, the more steeped in their mindset of this world they become. Some of us need to hear that because we know people that no longer allow us to use our hands to give them a track of truth. They don't want us to use our feet to escort them to the house of God, nor do they want the gospel that we preach to take root in their lives. But Christ's statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, reminds us that the actions and responses of others cannot stop the power and responsibility we have to pray. They don't want you to preach, but this text tells us they can't stop you from praying. They don't want you to share Jesus with them, but this text compels you to wear out your needs. They don't want you to teach them about the impending things that will shortly come upon the face of the earth. But it does not stop you from crying out to your God and agonizing with your Lord while you cannot make any headway with them. You can always make headway with him. Christ said it then and he pleads even now. Forgive them for they know what, not what they're doing. And that is our marching mantra as Christians. As we deal with a world that does not want what we want to give. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. The second thing I want you to see is this is that the behavior of other people does not determine yours. The first thing is we have a responsibility to forgive because this text won't release us. But also the behavior of other people does not determine our behavior. And if we can be honest today, there are people who have hurt us badly if you've lived long enough, you know that's true. And if we are honest, grace is not the resolution that we have in mind for them. There are people who we don't like for good reason. They get on our last nerve and represent everything that we loathe. And what we wish for them is not exorbitant mercy. We want them to get what they have coming. We want the Lord to come soon, not only because he will resurrect the righteous, not only because we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, no, not only because he will do away with sin, but we want him to come because he's bringing his reward with him. And there are those who will receive a reward 
that does not include the vacation of heaven and eternal life on earth. We don't want forgiveness extended with no strings attached. Nor do we want mercy to violate our sense of what is right. We want everybody to play by the rules. And when they don't, we want them to be held accountable. But here's the rub. God does. And that's exactly why Jesus uttered that critical statement to set the tone right from the start. Father, forgive, for they know not what they are doing. In one of my early districts, I never forget a parishioner that I will refer to as Mary, so who that. taught me a valuable lesson. She had a husband who was not a part of the church, who had no intention of joining the church. In fact, it seemed like his only task in life was to make her life miserable. Mm. And anything that she wanted to do for the church, any time that she wanted to spend for the church, anything, she was going to pay for it dearly. He was meaner than a junkyard dog. <laughs> he persecuted her at home. She knew that every time she came out to the church, that she was going to pay a price when she came home. But every time she would come to church after the service, while others were busy gay before she would leave. I would always see her in the corner praying. And a couple of times I walked by and she would be praying to herself, uh, 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 barely oblivious to whatever was happening around us. And she would say, she would just be praying for her husband. Well, one day her husband became critically ill and he was in the hospital and as pastor, I went to visit. And when I went to visit there, Mary was there by his bedside. I could not help but think that if he would pass a lot of Mary's disappointment and a lot of her pain would be released. But much to my surprise, when I went into the room, every time I would visit them, she would be in there praying on her knees. God, you cannot take him yet. <laughs> yeah. The doctors had already told Mary it looked dim. It looked like there was nothing they could do. They, they didn't see a medical solution, but Mary was on her knees and I could hear her say, Lord, you cannot Take him yet. You promised. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know that Mary continued that prayer, and it doesn't happen like this all the time. We, we, we are mature enough to know. But that man recovered. Amen. Got his come to Jesus moment and Cain was baptized, became a deacon in the church until he Hallelujah. died. Praise the Lord, brother. Why? Because Mary said, Father, forgive him. For he does not know what he is doing. And God, you promised. Mm -hmm. Lord honored 
the feeble prayer of Mary. Yes. Praise the Lord. Brought her husband to his senses. Yeah. Father, forgive them mm. for they know not what they do. Yes, sir. Incidentally, in the original language, Christ's statement is in the imperfect tense, which means that he did not utter this particular last word once. He did not just say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. No, it's in the imperfect tense, which means he kept saying over and over and over again, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Hallelujah. Every time the hammer hit its mark, Jesus declared, I will return evil with good. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they were doing. Every time the spike spears their flesh, Jesus Christ said, blessed are they that persecute me. Every time they drove a nail, he said, Father, forgive, because for God, love is always more important than being right. Incidentally, I just thought of this, but if right were more important than love, then none of us would <laughs> ever be saved. That's right. That's right. No, this statement is the heart of the gospel. Love is always more important than being right. That's right. Mary yeah. understood that. Yes, sir. And Jesus understood that. And if Christ could pray from the cross, that emblem of suffering and shame, yes, then there is no circumstance that can prevent me from reaching the Father in prayer. And with this first statement from the cross, Jesus Christ introduces a new power available to the Christian. The power that we have to forgive. A new power that represents the ripe fruit of the cross experience. A new way of responding to evil out of control. A new replacement for an eye for an eye with a turn the other cheek. A new order of business, justice, will have its time. You don't have to worry about it. Everybody will get what they deserve. But what this statement reminds us of is that justice will have its time, but its time is not yet. It is, yes. It's mercy's time now. Mercy. It's mercy. grace time now. Grace. New marching orders. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. In a rural community, there is an unusual steeple on the top of the oldest church in town. It is revered by the members of the community, seen as a landmark that distinguishes this little town because of its significance. You see, instead of a typical cross that is usually put on top of churches in the steeple as a sign that this is a Christian institution, this landmark church had a replica of a lamb as its steeple sign. See, many years ago, the church roof needed extensive repairs. It was a large church. And so the apex of the roof was very high. And it had the potential to be dangerous for anybody up on the roof trying to repair it. Well, while attempting to repair the top of the roof, a 
construction worker lost his footing and fell off of the roof. And he was heading for a certain death, but for a miracle. You see, at the exact same time that he fell, a shepherd happened to be herding his flock of sheep through the town, wow. right past the church. And the man was able to break his fall by landing on a land. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah. The man lived yeah. because the lamb died. Breaking <laughs> his fall. It would have been justice for the righteous wrath of God to fall on them as they disrespected the son of God. Nailed goodness to a tree. Mocked him and ridiculed him and beat him. It would have been justice for the righteous wrath of God to fall on us but it did not. And the only reason it did not was because justice was turned to mercy by a prayer. Yes, sir. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Yes. Father, we thank you today. Yes, sir for the privilege that is ours mm -hmm. to allow our mind's eye to drift back to that moment when our Lord and Savior suffered and bled and died for us. And we're so thankful, Lord, that our Jesus in the worst moment of his life decided to make a conscious choice to break our fall. Decided in a conscious moment to not allow the angels to administer justice. But responded instead with a new power from a prayer. Father, forgive them. Yes. For they know not what they are doing. Yes. And may this prayer be our mantra as Christians. And my admonition to everyone within the sound of my voice. Because of Christ and because of this utterance. Mm -hmm. Go and do likewise. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 Wow. Amen. Father, forgive Amen. them for they know not what they are doing. Now it's time for the prayer for the nation. Lord of our fathers, known of old, Lord of our far from battle line, beneath whose awful hand we fall, dominion over fire and fire. Lord, God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget. Lord God of hosts, this world, this nation is drunk with the wine of madness. It is drunk with the bid for power. Mm. It has lost its sight of what it means to be kind and forgiving. It has lost love and caring. Father, our tongues spew the venom of hate, anger, and boast. Lord God of hosts, we have forgotten what it means to love. We have forgotten what it means to embrace others and to share with them. But Lord, I ask today that you will heal our land, heal the nations of their maladies, and help, Lord, help us all to remember what you did for us over 2,000 years ago. Yes. When Amen. you gave your all so that we can have life everlasting. Yeah. Lord, God of us, Help our nations not to forget. In your precious name, I ask. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen.